Okay, um, if you would get out um, new sets of notes, if you would get out the uh, set of notes on Judaism, please. They are uh, handout 12, 12A, 12B, 12C, okay, 12D, and that um, will be helpful for what we're doing in class. Also, uh, handout 17, okay? If you would kind of root around in your notes and turn various things up. Handout 17 is the last page of the whole set. Those are the questions for the final. There are three questions on Judaism, uh, questions three, four, and five. Um, <clears throat> just incidentally, at the top of the page, it again talks about the six categories um, applied to the different religions in the second half of the course. Okay? So um, that obviously is an encyclopedic question. And one would respond to that question only to one of those religions. Namely, it would be to take one of those religions and go through the uh, six categories, which, of course, is on the back of all of the uh, individual uh, introductions, the, the abbreviated um, um, table of contents that I have for each film. So, for example, the one on Judaism would be on um, the back of handout 12A. Okay, well, I'll look at those in a minute. Uh, number two, question two, is an overview, in a way, of what is the whole course about? You know, what is religion? And where does one find the ultimate value? And who are you, which really fits uh, a lot of the Eastern religion in terms of depth, okay? So yesterday, when we were looking at the film on uh, Japanese religion, and Ronald Ayer asked one of those abbots, he said, what is the most important thing that a human being should do? And the abbot said, almost without hesitation, he said, to know yourself. I believe it, okay? Uh, mainly because one's self somehow is the presence of the infinite, that one is level four. Now, that thou art is the expression from Hinduism, but it has a very rich resonance and a rich value in the Christian tradition. So if you remember uh, very quickly when I was talking about immanence and transcendence, we recognized that the religions of immanence are Hinduism, Buddhism, and Taoism, okay? and that the religions of transcendence are uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, okay? that really emphasize the transcendence of God. Well, uh, those of you that come out of a sacramental uh, Christian tradition, which would be Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, uh, to some extent also Lutheran and Anglican Episcopal, the whole concept of sacrament is the divine present in physical things, which is why it was such an object of suspicion to the Reformed Protestant movement, which was really worried about and rightfully worried about the Catholic Church so um, in criminally, in terms of charging money for indulgences, uh, rooting the experience of the divine in physical things. And yet to absolutely exclude the presence of the divine in physical things is to exclude the presence of the word of God in Jesus of Nazareth. So it's a little awkward to say that Christianity is a religion of transcendence and not immanence. Because if we say in Hinduism, okay, that, uh, that thou art, you are level four now, and that's what Siddhartha, the Buddha, woke up to, okay? In, excuse me, <coughs> in Christianity, and certainly in sacramental Christianity, you are the indwelling of the Holy Spirit now, okay? You receive the Eucharist. St. Augustine has a marvelous line about receiving Holy Communion when he says it's not so much that you receive uh, the, the uh, divine presence inside you, but you are received into God. Okay, So it certainly would be a, a very interesting uh, development in the experience of imminence. Well, at any rate, <coughs> they had these, so that would touch on question two. That's how I got onto that particular riff. But what is religion? Where do you find ultimate value? And who are you? And that will be something we can be at least aware of as we go through these religions in the second half of the course. Okay? However, 
What I asked you to do was to get out the uh, handouts on uh, Judaism, which are the handouts uh, that begin with uh, uh, the number 12. Okay, so uh, 12 is the material from Houston Smith's text. Okay, we're going to see in the video tomorrow an emphasis on the search for meaning, the struggle for meaning. It might even have a certain tension for you, as it certainly does for me, that one of the four noble truths, that life is suffering, and suffering is caused by grasping, and the next thing you know, we're dealing with the prophetic spirit of Judaism that you need to grasp for justice, to grasp for meaning, okay? And so we're going to see some interesting uh, imagery for the search for meaning. How do you understand a musical score? If you're looking at a string quartet that Beethoven wrote painfully, which is an issue in the video and an issue in Judaism as it looks at suffering and the Holocaust, then Beethoven is an interesting example of suffering because he was losing his hearing as this incredible genius is uh, composing some of the most beautiful music in the history of the world and he's losing his hearing. So it's obviously an example of suffering, which we'll touch on, okay, and an important issue uh, as it was in Buddhism, but in the way is, uh, do you deal with suffering by letting go, or do you deal with suffering by creating a just world, or understanding God's presence in suffering? But at any rate, handout 12, if you notice, if you're looking at handout 12 now, so I'm, I did nag you a bit about getting the uh, handouts for the 12, so if you have handout 12 in front of you, notice that A, B, C, D, E, F, G, okay, meaning in God, meaning in creation, meaning, 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 search for meaning. Uh, what did God intend? What are human beings supposed to do? Uh, what is suffering supposed to accomplish? So all kinds of drive, uh, the kinds of questions that very often drive women and men very powerfully in religious experience, but that also drive women and men to reject religion because uh, religion seems phony and it can't answer those questions or because if God is all good, all powerful, all loving, why is there suffering in the world? Okay, so 12 is what you've uh, come to expect to find uh, that is an outline of Houston Smith's material, okay? 12a is also what you've grown to expect, the overview of the video, which again, I'm, I can be, practice a little bit of one-upsmanship with you now, you practicing it also, that you could look over this quickly and say, well, okay, that's what we're going to see tomorrow. <clears throat> I, I uh, said something very quickly about that the first day of class, but of course we had to then go and see the video on primal religion and you never really had a chance to read this overview ahead of time. But some of you might almost want to pick a fight with me, and I'm happy to have that happen, okay? You might well say, Gilmore, those videos are time, life, journalism. The BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation, that's who made the films, Time, Life, BBC. It's their take on those major religions, which of course are filtered through the women and men who directed the videos and, and edited them and decided. So you're seeing um, what other people decided would be a digest of that religion. And then you're seeing that, of course, in a video, an edited video. And then you're reading Gilmore's edited version of it here. You might be better off not reading 12A ahead of time. And it is you and the video. <clears throat> Excuse me. Some of the great uh, teachers of the last century or so have talked about when you're reading really great literature, so you're reading Shakespeare or uh, Milton or some contemporary authors, okay, they basically say, read it yourself. Don't read a commentary. Don't let something get between you and the author's experience. So that might go in this situation also. However, you might also say, Gilmore, we have strong enough egos. We're not going to get bullied by you. We can read this very quickly and get a sense of it, okay? By the way, I need to make sure, do you all have 12A printed on both sides? I just took a look at mine 
And, um, and that's printed on both sides. Matt, is that true of yours too? I, I don't have my hands with me. Okay. Well, let me um, let me stop this for a second and get you a set of handouts. Okay. Because. Okay. So you, everybody has a copy of 12, 12, um, um, uh, 12 B. 12B is some material about Eli Wiesel. That's how you pronounce his name, Eli Wiesel. And he's a significant person in the film that we're going to see tomorrow. He personally survived the Holocaust. I frequently tell a class that, um, to go back to slight vulgarities, you know, besides saying bumper stickers are about the fact that stuff happens, you're liable to walk out of that film, okay, tomorrow, pissed off. Because Eli Wiesel is going to say, you are responsible for the Holocaust. I'm not interested that you were born in the 1990s or whenever. Okay, somehow the guilt is uh, something that extends across. Because he talks, he says some very aggressive things. Okay, uh, for example, he will say, "True, not all the victims, um, all the vi not all the victims were Jews." Okay, because and he doesn't go on to explain. Uh, they also uh, the Nazis tried to exterminate the Gypsies and any number of other. Uh, unwanted peoples, um, uh, handicapped people and what have you. So he says, true, not all the victims were Jews, but all the Jews were victims and all the killers were Christian. Mm -hmm. So he really is indicting Christianity and he's asking aggressive questions about where genocide comes from. So everybody notice we're just, uh, I, again, I keep referring to um, um, the Wizard of Oz and saying things like, Dorothy, you're not in Kansas anymore. Everybody here, okay? We're just not at a tea ceremony anymore. We're facing a Jewish prophet who is a pain in the butt, okay? Which prophets are almost by definition. Somebody who will really um, stick pins in you and, and, and attempt to... Uh, uh, um, uh, persuade you out of your complacency of whatever kind. So being a, a prophet is a very undesirable uh, occupation, as we saw from the way most of the Jewish prophets were treated. Okay? At any rate, Eli Wiesel was. And you may want to look at 12b, the two sides of 12b, because it will tell you something about Eli Wiesel. He's a significant personality in the film. I don't know how it can happen that people read one of his books in high school. Have any of you read Night? A book called Night. It's about the concentration camps. Okay? And it was the first book that he wrote. And it's horrific, as you can imagine. Okay? Because we're struggling with suffering and God's uh, involvement in suffering and responsibility for it and all the rest of it. But just the suffering itself is pretty horrific. Okay? He lived through it. Okay? He was uh, swept up and uh, was young enough. I think he was 14 when he went into the concentration camps, and he uh, survived it. His father uh, died uh, almost before his eyes, okay? So that's 12B, okay? 12C, uh, simplistically, 12C is the answer. Here I go again, getting insecure about uh, being simplistic. 12C is the answer to question four. What does it mean to say Judaism is a system of communication? I'm from handout 17. You don't need to have a hand, copy of handout 17 with you now, but just make a note to that effect or remember it. That that is the material on handout 12C. And I'll be drawing arrows and doing various things tomorrow to make that, I hope, uh, be that much more uh, uh, memorable. Okay? So that's 12C. And then 12D is, in a way, the answer to question three. And keep tw uh, 12D around because that's an outline of a good deal of what we'll be doing in class today. Okay? So we're going to deal mostly with what's the material that's on 12D. Okay? Okay? So that tells you what those four pages are that are part of the 12 series on Judaism. <clears throat> and of course, for Monday, we'll be into pages 13 on Islam, okay? And I might just start this off by uh, the ironies and the, um, um, the richnesses 
of uh, cultural experience that may kind of grab you. Okay? Now, there's probably nobody in this room who is unaware of the challenges of contemporary Israel, the country Israel in, uh, on the eastern shore of the Eastern Mediterranean, right? Everybody's up to speed on that in various ways. The Palestinian uh, challenges, the intifada, people blowing each other up on buses, uh, knife attacks and stuff like that. The whole question of the Palestinians being thrown out of what was, uh, in many cases, their own homelands because the uh, Jewish community would understand that a great deal of it was their homeland and stuff like that. Everybody's sort of up. And, and also the challenge between Islam and Judaism. Point of departure. Yitzrael, okay, Israel. Yitzrael means he who struggled with God. Yitzrael. And this is a single person. This is Jacob, and you have some of this on the top of handout um, 12D. This is Jacob in the book of Genesis, okay, chapter 32, when an angel of the Lord, which the major broad-minded uh, middle of the road uh, not extremist contemporary scripture scholars point out is a respectful way of referring to God, the angel of the Lord, uh, without denying the existence of angels. But for example, in the, revel the great revelation of God to uh, uh, Moses in the burning bush, okay, in Exodus 3.14, Okay, Moses approaches the bush to see, well, how could it be on fire and it not be consumed and what was going on there. And um, uh, the angel of the Lord speaks out of what and God said. There's a very glib and effortless uh, back and forth between uh, the angel of the Lord and the Lord. Okay, and a whole profound Jewish respect um, for the reality of God and the fact that one does not blithely and superficially um, um, take the Lord's name. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. So, slight tangent. <clears throat> if any of you are with women and men who are Jewish, you never say Yahweh. Okay? You say the Lord. You might say Adonai or Adonai. Okay, which is Hebrew for the Lord, but you don't say the name. You might even more respectfully say Hashem, which means the name, the holy name. Okay, at any rate, which is another indication of the, the dimensions of respect and uh, uh, response to the authentic presence of God, and yet most respectfully um, uh, putting some distance between the uh, untouchable holiness and transcendence of God and the fact that God is communicating with a human being. So at any rate, Yitzrael, his, that is Jacob. Is everybody picking up on this? I'm about to say something intentionally ironic and a little bit in your face. Israel is not a country. No, it's a country. Right. Israel is a single human being. Israel is Jacob when he struggled with God the whole night long, and then the following morning, uh, um, his uh, hip is sore and uh, his sciatic nerve is affected by this because he struggled with God, okay? So Yitzrael is a single person. He is the one who struggled with God, okay? As we see this. Now, uh, I want to be, um, um, uh, continue that business that I set up a minute ago when I was talking about the Palestinians and the tensions between Islam and Judaism, Yitzrael means struggle. Islam means submission. Every so often, uh, this is another tangent which I will pursue and we'll uh, talk about it somewhat when we get to Islam. And to some extent, it's relevant to struggle in Judaism. But Islam does not mean peace. It means submission. And the submission to Allah is what leads to peace. Okay, so we've got the primary, I guess I'm going to stay on that um, edge that I've challenged you all with since the first uh, major religion that we looked in here, okay? The primal Jewish experience is struggle. 
Lord God, I am nothing. Abraham says that repeatedly when he's bargaining with God about not to, so that God will not destroy uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. And he's saying, if I can find 40 just people, will you not destroy the city? And God says, well, okay. And then Abraham says, well, excuse me, but I'm but dust and ashes and I'm really nothing. But, uh, and it's like two people bargaining in a, in a Mideastern bazaar. Uh, would, you, would you go for 30? And he basically bargains God down to 10. And then he can't find 10 just people. But what's going on there is um, a, 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 a struggle with God, okay? As opposed to, so Yitzrael means struggle, Islam means submission. The primal experience of both religions, who are sons and daughters of the same womb, of the same desert, and their real primal religious experience is opposite, opposite. So one more thing, we're going to see um, Muslims, as you may have seen in pictures, kneeling and touching their foreheads to the ground, okay, the tip of their, uh, right where you hit a soccer ball, you know, right on that uh, kind of a high above your forehead, okay, and Jews standing and moving back and forth. And the posture, and I mean that both physically and psychologically and religiously, the posture of Judaism. I'm going to use a word that's maybe a little bit too strong. The posture of Judaism, in part, is defiance. Lord God, so I'm back to this, I am but dust and ashes. Lord God, I'll make it grosser. Lord God, I'm a maggot. I'm a nothing. But Lord God, you have chosen me. So I am daughter. Maybe I deserve to be recognized as dust and ashes or a maggot or an untouchable or whatever else. But you have chosen me. I am daughter. I am son. And God, let's get this straight. You owe me, God if I am son or daughter. You don't owe me anything as dust and ashes. But if I am chosen and I am beloved daughter and I am beloved son, to quote a Jewish comedian, can we talk? Can we, can we talk about this? Or do we just have to roll over and play dead? Okay? So, Yitzhayel means struggle. He who struggled with God. And we're going to see that as a critical dimension all the way along. So I want to take handout 12D uh, and work with it, okay? That Yitzrael means that. Now, by the way, you probably, if you've heard of uh, the uh, Jewish scriptures and the Christian scriptures in various ways, you've heard the expression, the sons of Israel, okay? Oh, children of Israel, okay? That not only means uh, participants in the nation, but it means physical descendants of Jacob, okay? The sons of Jacob and their wives and their children, okay, are descendants of Jacob. So you have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as the three major patriarchs of Judaism. And every so often you'll hear now in a more broad-minded way, and I'll have to see if I can get this right, um, you have, uh, um, O oh God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Sarah, and Rebecca, and Rachel, and Leah. Okay, that there are matriarchs as well as patriarchs. Okay, so that dimension of the women's movement, which is a struggle in our society, is very much part of Judaism. So in Reform uh, Judaism, you have women who are rabbis and who run congregations. Okay, at any rate, let's begin to look then at what's, uh, what's here as the struggle. Okay, the striving for meaning. Okay, we'll hear. A, uh, a member of a string quartet in the film tomorrow saying, you strive to find the truth. Okay, you search for it. And that's why I'm saying there, you strive for meaning in multiple areas. And we just looked at handout 12, sections A through G, meaning in God, meaning in humanity, meaning in suffering, meaning in history. Okay, meaning, 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 uh, uh, searching for it. 
Okay? Now, I already touched on this in, in music, and this is a nice metaphor in the video. And by the way, let me, well, I'm about to say warn you, and that's a little strong. Um, anybody here ever listened to a string quartet? Do you know what a string quartet is? Okay. It's, I find when I teach this material, I use the word abrasive more than maybe I should. Um, because part of this uh, Jewish challenge for meaning is abrasive. What, anyway, the reason that I said something is uh, almost uh, impolite as to say you would be pissed off walking out of here having heard what Eli Wiesel has to say about Christianity, okay, is that he is so abrasive, okay? And Ronald Ayer, okay, the British commentator that we've been listening to, who's kind of tweedy and British and very proper and what have you, and one has to be careful here because are we going to end up saying things that are anti-Semitic? Okay, got to watch out for anti-Semitism anti here and be a little paranoid there and politically correct. And Ronald Lear is talking to one of these people and he says, why is it, whenever I'm in a conversation with a Jew, I find myself in the midst of an argument. <laughs> is that, you know, is that anti-Semitic or whatever? And the person to whom he, he addresses that question, who is a member of this string quartet, says, right, we from childhood are taught to struggle to understand the meaning of scripture. You all are going to see something that it could not be more dramatically relevant. Namely, it's what we would call a university, which is very Gentile. We don't want to impose that upon the Jewish experience. They call it a yeshiva. That's, that's on handout 12, a the word, uh, Y-E-S-H-I-V-A, which is a, a Jewish study hall. Okay? And these people are all arguing out loud. You can't hear yourself think, you would think in such a situation. In an old-fashioned uh, era, when we didn't have the kind of telephone switchboards that we have now, and you may have even seen these in some old-fashioned movies where a switchboard operator is taking uh, uh, t uh, uh, connectors out and reconnecting, what have you, and they're all in a big room full of switch yard, uh, switch, uh, switchboard operators, and they're all talking at once, and it's kind of pandemonium. Uh, what Ronald Ayer says is set down in the middle of this, and you might think we're in a, a switchboard or in an auction, because people are studying in pairs out loud struggling to understand what the scripture is saying. So they're going to be saying things like, uh, remember, Abraham and his wife were in their 80s and had no children. And the Lord God, the angel of the Lord, appears and says, you're going to have a child. And that strikes Sarah as absolutely ridiculous because she's on the far side of menopause. Okay, and Abraham doesn't know what to do this. They have one son, and the son is Isaac. <clears throat> And the Lord God, somewhere along the line, says, Abraham, I want you to take your only son up onto the mountaintop and murder him as a human sacrifice. And it's relevant, and we know this from archaeology, there was plenty of human sacrifice that went on back then. Okay? And even the, as we see in the uh, books of Kings, when various uh, Jewish kings were really threatened by outside adv uh, advisors, uh, 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 outside attackers or invaders or what have you, one of the fallback positions was to sacrifice one of your children to one of the Canaanite gods. Cover, kind of cover your bases, okay? And therefore, human sacrifice was possible. So these um, studying um, young Jews in Israel today are looking at a section of scripture where the Lord God takes Abraham and says, I want you to take your son up onto a mountaintop and cut his throat and burn him on a funeral pyre as a sacrifice to the Lord God. Yo, God, what do you do? Why, why, why this poor old man? Why are you testing his obedience? Are you jerking him around? Was, were you really gonna have him kill his child if he hadn't been obedient? What's, go, what's behind this? So, what we'll hear is about the Talmud, T-A-L-M-U-D, and that's in print in a couple of places. You don't necessarily have to write it down now. But that the Talmud is the struggle of the Jewish community across 2,500 years to understand what God meant. So, the struggle for meaning. So, at any rate, 
the metaphor is I started when I was talking about a string quartet. I asked if anybody here had heard a string quartet, okay? I personally find string quartets kind of abrasive. Here's that word again, okay? A string quartet is of two violins, a viola, and a cello. And we're gonna see one in here, and you're gonna hear a lot of music, and it's from Beethoven's 16th string quartet, which he composed when he was deaf. So I mentioned this as a problem in suffering, okay? So, okay, everybody, I want you to put up with this. I'm God. And uh, Matt, you are brilliant in sculpture and uh, uh, creating things with your hands. So we're going to give you rheumatoid arthritis, haha. -ha. Okay? And Ashley, who is having a good time over there, um, she's really good at painting, so we're going to make her blind, haha. -ha. Remember, I'm God. Okay? And you write, you know, you're uh, the phenomenal musician. So we're going to make you deaf. Okay? So that's a problem in suffering that is embedded in the film and embedded in the experience of the film. Okay? At any rate, string quartets are abrasive. Okay? A string quartet is kind of a mini symphonic orchestra. Okay? And um, a, uh, the first movement of a string quartet, uh, a, a, a classical string quartet, or at any rate in um, um, Mozart and Beethoven's time, is like the first movement of a symphony where you have a beautiful or challenging theme and then it's modulated, which means uh, those of you that play guitar or what have you, you would know that when something is in C, you also play G seventh and F, okay? Or if it's in D, you would also have uh, chords that are in A and E. So that's what uh, a classical composer would do is he would start off with an important theme, say, in A, and then he or she would put it then into D or E and, 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 and develop it. But at the conclusion, uh, when you've uh, developed about as much as you want, you have to get back to where you started. So you have what is called a bridge section, which is where all of these different, possibly dissonant, okay, components are kind of being brought back together. And I think one of the things that we're going to hear is one of those bridge sections. And it is really dissonant. You're hearing violins and what have you going. Are you guys um, of an age, were you ever, were all of you ever in classrooms that had blackboards? Have anybody been in blackboards? You have, you've given a blackboard. Okay, possibly, you know what it is, huh? Pardon? Yeah, like second grade. A long time ago. A long time ago. Yeah, more. you're talking out of the Smithsonian as usual. Okay, but sometimes they're green. Okay? I want you guys to experience something that I did that I now look back on as cruelty to animals, but anyway, I did this to high school students. Okay? So you guys have uh, had afternoon classes at Spring Hill College, and you've had a nice lunch, and you're sort of in a carbohydrate haze, and you're kind of, your upper and lower eyelids are starting to kind of meet. Okay? I had homeroom with a bunch of advanced placement Latin uh, uh, high school, Jesuit high school students, and they would all kind of start sleeping in the afternoon. And I would um, notice that they were starting to go to sleep, and I would get five fingernails. Everybody knows where I'm going on this, right? And I'd go, you know, and everybody would wake up real quick, okay? You know, more that's a great example of something that is abrasive. That's my take on some aspects of string quartets. And you may agree when you've seen the film, okay? But let's go back to the handout here. <coughs> Namely, with music, what you have is you have a score. Those of you who have possibly seen a score, uh, if you, you know, somebody who plays guitar, or if you do, or whatever else, you know, you might have a score. Uh, you might just have the uh, lyrics and the chords. And if you know the melody, well, then you can play it the way it ought to be. But if you know music, you can read a score, okay? But the score is just black marks on paper, right? What did the composer intend, okay? If you've ever looked at a classical uh, score, you'll see words like lente or um, um, uh, um, forte, fortissime, or you'll see things that tell you how to interpret Music. How do you interpret scripture? 
So there's a direct parallel there between what the composer put down and the composer is Beethoven. Ah, no, the composer is not Beethoven. The composer is God. God communicated this. How do we understand it? How do we come to understand this? So there's a parallel then, and that's what I have in the page here, between the uh, concept of the experience of music and what did the composer intend and scripture, what did God intend with the suffering of Job. We'll talk about that a little bit when we're talking about uh, the uh, Holocaust. And um, 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 there's, a, there's a frightening story in there where Elie Wiesel talks about writing a play uh, and he's going to introduce a, uh, a character into a play that he's writing about suffering. And the character is Satan. And that Satan is the one who defends God at, uh, in the concentration camps. I mean, if this doesn't mess with your head, I don't know what does. It really messes with my head, okay? That Satan, because Satan does not mean, in the Hebrew experience, somebody with black wings and cloven hooves uh, and pitchforks who's down in hell, uh, you know, stabbing people and, and coming up and tempting. Uh, 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 mm, mm. Satan means the one who tests. And the heavenly court in the book of Job is testing Job. So God is testing Job? Well, this is done with the permission of God or the acceptance of God, the members of God's court, because they're looking at Job and Job is completely innocent. And their take on the situation is, oh, great. It's easy for him to be innocent. It's easy for him to be uh, a good uh, religious believer and all the rest of that. Let's start making him suffer. Let's kill off his children. Let's kill off his crops. Let's kill off uh, anything that he loves, okay? So, you know, you might think, well, this is pretty tough on Job, but it's a little tough on his children and his wife and his animals too, huh? Because they're getting killed off. Why? Where is, so the whole book of Job is a meditation on suffering and the justification or lack of it. And I already said something about the sacrifice of Isaac by Abraham, okay? Um, the discussion of the law is what I mentioned when I was talking about, uh, as Ronald Ayer says, a Hebrew telephone exchange or an auction where these people are. So um, under A here, one, two, and now I'm up to three, okay, are all examples of animated struggles, okay? They embody the meaning of Yitzrael, okay? The Talmud, okay? Now we're going to see a very nice metaphor of the Talmud. Okay, the Talmud is a book, okay? But the, it's a book that is a record of a struggle, okay? And Ronald Ayer has a very nice metaphor there where he says it's like looking at the rings of a tree, okay? My son-in-law was just asking me about, um, did I have any pecan uh, fi uh, firewood? And I said, well, I just happened to have cut down three trees in the last year and cut them up for firewood. I still have to split them. But you look at it, and I said, if it's begun to split, you can tell it's dry, we can use it, stuff like that. So yesterday, I was taking um, something to keep the wood dry off of it, and we were looking at a cross-section of a tree, where you have the center, and then you have the rings that go out. A page of Talmud has perhaps either the oldest comment in the center, or a section of scripture in the center. And as Ronald Ayer says, ringed round by centuries of argument. And he says there are blank margins on the page where further comment can be added. What do women and men think, search, write, struggle in understanding God? Okay? So notice how under uh, number A, okay, one, two, three, and four are all about struggle, about striving. So the Talmud is the written record, as Ronald Ayer says, the Talmud is the written record of the struggle across 2,500 years, okay? Which is an interesting take, by the way, of some fundamentalist, Catholic and Protestant, that you can open scripture and it means what it says. You know, all, all you have to do with the Bible is open it up and it, mean, it means what it says. I don't think so. Now, there's a, I want to be respectful there because you might say you open it and it means what it says because you understand that the Holy Spirit okay, reveals to women and men at that privileged moment that they're going to understand. And it will mean what it says because it's being spoken by the Holy Spirit 
to the individual soul at that moment. Well, that's very different from uh, the kind of struggle that we're talking about when you're attempting to understand what the ancient civilization experienced and meant and all the rest of it, okay? So, now, then we go to uh, B, which is, uh, continues the struggle in prayer, you know? For some reason, the males rock back and forth. You may find it distracting, but when they're at the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem, the males are rocking back and forth. The women are all standing quietly. And there's a beautiful, beautiful uh, comment where Ronald Ayer is saying, if you don't know the history, you can't share the feeling. And there's a woman's hand going down the rock, feeling the rock face of the Wailing Wall. Okay, which has been there for 2,100 years or thereabouts okay, uh, since Herod built it. This is the second temple. The first temple was destroyed by the Babylonians in, a, in uh, 587 BC okay, or BCE. Okay, and this temple was built by uh, Herod the Great, okay, <clears throat> roughly uh, in the century uh, preceding the lifetime of Jesus. Okay, so those walls have been there for about 2,100 years. Well, anyway, the woman's hand is going down the wall, and Ronald Ayer is saying, if you don't know the history, you can't feel the feeling, and she's feeling the wall. Okay, in, in, in the, the woman and the women's uh, prayer strikes us as much more recognizable because it's the way Westerners pray in terms of, uh, of stillness and contemplative prayer, okay? But prayer is still a challenge, the acceptance of it, the meaning of the Sabbath. There's a very good uh, description of the Sabbath. Not a description, there's an actual uh, taping of a Sabbath. They point out that you can't do anything on the Sabbath day, so they, they wouldn't be able to tape an a actual Sabbath meal. And he says it's a recreation on a Tuesday. So we do that, okay? So then we go into number C, okay? Which is the struggle of the Holocaust, okay? And that's where I have Elie Wiesel, which is the way you pronounce his name, okay? The word prophet comes from the Greek word, so it's not a Hebrew word. Prophet is a, is a Greek word, and it means to speak in behalf of, prophemi. The Greek word to speak is phemi. Prophemi means to testify to or to speak in behalf of, as I have there. And then secondarily, it means to foretell the future. <clears throat> you guys surf the movie channels in the dead of night, and maybe every so often come up with a black and white movie that's from the 1930s and it's a gangster movie. And Bugsy, uh, the gangster, is about to be grabbed by the police and Bugsy turns to one of his friends and Bugsy says, Hey, Mikey, I want you to get me a mouthpiece. What's a mouthpiece? A lawyer. Okay, so the gangster slang would be, I want you to get me a mouthpiece. Somebody who speaks in behalf of an advocate, okay? So that a prophet is one who speaks in behalf of God, and then since he speaks or she speaks in behalf of God, presumably what he or she hands on is what God has revealed, and that if it has anything to do with a coming disaster that's going to hit uh, Israel from the Assyrians or the Babylonians, okay? That itself is going to be uh, a truth about future happenings, which is why you have this whole experience of um, um, prophecy as uh, anticipation of the future, okay? So, but Anna Wiesel is not telling the future. Anna Wiesel, one could say, is speaking in behalf of God because his issue is justice, okay? What has happened, okay? And the issue is not just an issue that human beings are responsible for the Holocaust, okay? The issue is God, here we go again, God, hmm? if we are your chosen people, and you are all-knowing, all-loving, you know, all-powerful and all the rest of it, why is there such incredible suffering? You all probably heard a thing or two about the Holocaust. There's going to be some uh, um, excerpts in the film from the photography that's at the uh, Holocaust Museum uh, in uh, Jerusalem. 
Okay, maybe it's in Tel I think it is in Jerusalem. Have any of you, uh, any of you go to museums in Washington, D.C.? Have you been to those, the Smithsonian's and Jerusalem? There's one called the Holocaust Museum, okay? Which I've been with somebody who hadn't been in this course and had no idea what to expect and walked out just stunned. There is a room full of shoes that were worn by people who are now charcoal. They're the real shoes. In other words, when the Allies freed those concentration camps, and you possibly see these uh, pictures of these incredibly emaciated, literally skin and bones, and in some cases they died shortly after they were um, freed, or they died because they suddenly had access to more food and milk or whatever to drink, and they, they, they killed themselves by, uh, by eating too much or getting too rich food in their systems or what have you. But the Holocaust itself, and so there's a about, mm, oh, maybe a fifth or two-fifths of this film were on the Holocaust. Okay? We had a rabbi here who appropriately, his name was uh, Steve, uh, Stephen Jacob. Okay, and he taught. You may know there's a, a, a class here. I, I don't know if there's taught last semester. It gets taught every other semester or so. It's on Judaism. That's taught. It's sometimes taught in a night school. Sometimes taught during the day. It's um, sponsored by a Jewish uh, academic group, uh, and uh, so it's paid for independently. And it usually has the rabbi of the um, Reform Temple. Okay. And that was Steve Jacobs, who, we, who did that for a while. He taught a course here on Judaism, which closed out. I mean, he was really good, really good theater and stuff like that. One time he was teaching across the hall from me in um, Quinlan, and um, I was teaching Christology, and he was teaching Judaism. And the two of us said, why don't we put our classes together and just talk? So he comes into a class of Christians, perhaps predominantly Catholics, okay, in a Christology course on the divinity of Jesus Christ, and he walks in, and one of the first things he says is, where you guys got it wrong is struggle, challenge, dynamite. He taught this course on Judaism, and he taught a section on Holocaust, okay? People were interested and challenged or what have you. He began offering a separate elective course on the Holocaust. A three-credit course on the Holocaust. Anybody here want to sign up? Okay, whole three semesters on the Holocaust and the extermination of six million Jews and how many uh, Poles and how many Russians and how many uh, Gypsies and how many mentally defective and how many handicapped people or whatever else. It's all about the extermination. Okay, it closed out. Thirty people or so closed out. And somewhere along the line, he says, "Gilmore." Okay. You know the, some Eastern European Catholics pretty well, okay? Whose families were and still are pretty aggressively anti-Semitic. Now let's put this in context, okay, with you all. You, and by the way, with Rabbi uh, Steve Jacobs' class, you could take it for three credits in history or three credits in theology, okay? At any rate, what we dramatized then, and what I've dramatized is because I know the Lithuanian community somewhat well, okay? The Lithuanians are Catholic Eastern Europeans. They're not Slavic. They're pre-Slavic in a way. The Slavic countries, of course, are Poland and Russia and, Czech and Slovakia, Slovenia and various other places, Croatia, Serbia. Those are all Slavic countries. The Lithuanians are Baltic. The Baltic uh, are Lithuanian, um, <clears throat> Latvian, okay, and then there were uh, other languages that now no longer exist. Okay, they are intensely patriotic and intensely nationalist to the point of, you might say, racist. Okay, they're just stunningly beautiful and brilliant people. Okay, and ferociously anti Russian because they've been imposed on by the Russians and ferociously anti-German. Okay, let me change the, the context here. You guys, the four of us, okay, are in Lithuania in 1939. The German foreign minister, von Ribbentrop, has just cut a deal with Stalin where Russia gets the uh, Baltic countries and whatever else it is, and uh, Hitler is setting up a deal where he's going to invade Russia. But, okay, everybody in this room, okay? 
you guys have 20 minutes to choose between Stalin and Hitler. Who are you going to go with? I have met people personally who had to make that decision. And you may or may not be able to go to Australia or Canada or Argentina or someplace like that, but they might not accept you because you're an immigrant and they don't want anything to do with you. Okay? But you have 20 minutes. Who are you going to go with? The Lithuanians went with the West. They went with Germany. Okay? So any number of them were in Hitler's uh, war machine or in the SS which was the, um, the lightning brigades of uh, Hitler, the, the Hitler's personal bodyguard and what have you, some of whom were directly responsible for the Holocaust. Okay? So anyway, Rabbi Steve Jacobs says, Gilmore, you know, it's almost like a couple of Jewish comedians beginning to talk, Gilmore, you know, I, wanted, I want you to try something. Let's just see what we can do here. You're Catholic, okay, and you know the Eastern Europeans and Eastern, the Lithuanian, uh, uh, why don't you come to my class and talk about a Catholic theologian's response to the Holocaust? So what I did was I showed some of the most, uh, here we go again, abrasive, some of the most abrasive parts of the interview with Elie Wiesel, which you all are going to see tomorrow. Okay, when I said you're going to walk out of here pissed off. Okay, with Elie Wiesel saying through, all the Jews were victims and all the killers were Christians. And then he goes on to say, I don't know what it was in Christianity that made them do this, what have you. So I showed that. So I'm in, uh, I'm, you know, I'm in Steve Jacobs' class, not my class, this isn't when we put the two classes together, it's his class, okay? And I show that section of the video, okay? And the video has any number of remarks in there that Elie Wiesel makes, namely one outcry by Roosevelt uh, and he doesn't mention Pope Pius XII, but the Pope Pius XII has been you know, coming up with a lot of challenges here. What did he do? Uh, could he have saved more people? Should he have spoken out? What are the pros and cons? Struggle? At any rate, there are numerous things in there which talk about responsibility for the Holocaust. Okay? So we showed this film. And then it's me, and, and Steve Jacobs is in the class, and his whole class is there. Okay? And the first thing that I say is, what did Roosevelt do? What did Winston Churchill do? What did Pius XII do? Who cares? Phony baloney. The issue is, what did God do? That's the issue. The issue isn't what did Gentiles do who were uh, pawns in God's uh, uh, hands. Okay, we don't go around saying the Babylonians are all evil, the Assyrians are all evil because they conquered the northern kingdom or exiled the whole southern kingdom and sent them off into exile and stuff like that. The Egyptians, they don't get mocked and knocked and you know, accused of anti-Semitism or whatever. They were a bunch of barbarians who were instruments of God. Hmm? Instruments of God. So um, I'm kind of setting this up for when you see it. And I may develop it a little bit uh, tomorrow too, but um, I basically said, you know, um, one of the things that Gentiles do when challenged this way is say, what am I responsible for? You know, am I responsible for the glass ceiling that makes women not equal to men in the salary market today? Am I responsible for the lingering effects of racism? Uh, social justice, personal responsibility, struggle, okay? And one of the things that I said about blood and responsibility for the Holocaust is I said, speaking not to Rabbi Steve Jacobs, but speaking to the class, fellow Gentiles, we are probably the most effective killers that have existed on the planet. Now, you're probably going to say, well, no, Gilmore, there's been lots of others who've been pretty good at it. And you have Genghis Khan, you know, people making pyramids of skulls and stuff like that. Excuse me. Hmm? Hiroshima, Nagasaki. If you don't recognize the word Dresden, it is a, what once was a gorgeous medieval German city. The United States and England firebombed it. Okay? 
with intentionally setting everything on fire that was not blown up by uh, uh, explosives, all right, and cremated tens of thousands of people alive. There are those who've said that if the United States had lost World War II, we would have been put on trial the way we put the Nazis on trial at Nuremberg, okay? So we are really good at killing, okay? Dying person, okay? And so I think the beginnings of a Christian response to the Holocaust is to say Christians, unfortunately, do not see God in six million dying Jews. I want you to watch me and what I put on the board. I ever so often ask you to do that because it's something very specific. Christians do not see God in six million dying Jews. Jews do not see God in a single dying Jew. Where is God? What kind of God is God? Is God transcendent and above and apart and separate? Okay? Or is God in the midst of the anguish? Is God affected by our anguish and our suffering? Hmm? And Christian theology especially tends to look away from this and deal with God as some kind of mathematically uh, changeless being, of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The uh, mathematical symbols of circles and triangles are, are appropriate because there's a kind of a bloodless transcendence in a certain amount of Christian theology that God cannot suffer. God is above and apart and separate, which this denies. The incarnation denies the absolute transcendence of God. It doesn't uh, reject it, okay? It would accept it inclusively, okay? So I pointed out, I said it denies the absolute transcendence of God, okay? But this is profoundly immanent, and it's the beginnings of a Christian response to the Holocaust, okay? So what I'll also want to pick up on is, uh, um, again, what I said when, Ailey, when um, Steve Jacobs said, Gilmore, what does a Catholic and Christian theologian do with the Holocaust? Because I pushed it a little bit further and talked about where does genocide come from? Okay, and the fact that uh, you know, various peoples are really good at genocide. But let me just say this quickly to anticipate it. There's a certain amount of genocide in the Hebrew scriptures. Okay, when the walls of Jericho fall down and the army of Joshua goes straight forward, and I'm quoting the book of Joshua, chapter 6, verse 21, they kill every man, woman, child, donkeys, sheep, goats, camels, everything, because everything is corrupted by pagan worship. And therefore the Lord God wants it exterminated. Whoa. Okay, let me let you go.